Okay, so this evening's talk, I've already got a title for it, is called Finding Fault or Finding Beauty. And the putting those two together, you know, fault, complaining, seeing what's wrong, and seeing beauty in something, seeing goodness in something, all connects together, as you will soon find out. And the reason I'm giving this talk, because Again, the question on the internet <coughs> was uh, people, this was from somebody in Thailand and another video of a monk misbehaving went viral in Thailand and they say, well, can't we do something about our monks you know, when they misbehave? And many people have the understanding if you see a monk or a nun misbehaving if you complain, that's making a big sin. If you tell a monk off, you will go to hell. Don't tell what a monk uh, is doing which is wrong. That's very bad. You're destroying Buddhism. And of course, you know what happens when people have those sorts of ideas, that things get worse, worse and worse. So it's okay to tell a monk if they're doing something wrong as long as you're coming from the right place. Though you've got the information correct, because I learned when I was a young monk that yeah, it's okay to admonish one another, but you have to remember many things before you go and find fault with somebody else. And the first thing, obviously, if you're going to find fault with your wife, with your husband, with your parents, with your kids, with your monk, with your nun, with your politicians or whoever else you find fault with, make sure you get the facts right. Because so often we misunderstand and we don't know what really happened and we jump to conclusions and they always, not always, but many times I've been so embarrassed. One of those embarrassing times, I like telling all my embarrassing times when I made big mistakes. This was, uh, I only remember this some time ago, you know, maybe about a week or two weeks ago. And this was actually one of the stories in the first book. Because I would just taken over from my predecessor as the head monk in Bodhinyana Monastery, down at Serpentine. And I just wanted to do the right thing, to be a good leader. And one day, I was walking through the forest in the monastery at Serpentine. And as I was walking through, I found a rusty old hammer left out in the bush. Now you may all know that as monks, we live on charity. We don't have jobs. We don't get pensions from a government. Everything we have, even here, comes from your donations. And there are many hundreds, thousands of people look after these places. You come here because you enjoy it, and then after a while you want to support it. Same with monastery. Somebody, a generous, kind person, had given a hammer to help with our building work. And I don't know who it could be. It could be there are some really poor people on pensions and still they, they save up and they buy one of these hammers and offer it to us and I found a stupid monk had left it out in the forest and hadn't put it away and it was getting rusty. Now that is not how a monk or a nun, a good monk, is supposed to look after gifts. Now we have to remember, you work really hard. You know, it's tough, you know, living in this world. This was 20 years ago. There wasn't much money around. And some monk had been so careless and thoughtless as just to leave this, this gift out to get rusty and get damaged. So I was really upset. So I decided to call a meeting of all the monks and give them a, a talk. Not the nice talks you get here with lots of jokes, just... No, you can't do this. This is wrong. You must look after people's property. You must not be... You have more mindfulness. And care for things, for goodness sake. And I really let them have it. And all the monks, they weren't 
There was no sort of stopping. It was all sitting perfectly straight. You know when you really, you know, give a really tough talk, they're all perfectly straight, back straight, you know, not daring to move. I, I think I really went a bit too far. But what really disappointed me was after I gave this lecture to the monks at Bodhinyana Monastery for being so careless as to not look after you know, your generous gifts. What disappointed me, not one monk confessed that it was them. And there's something inside of me, like I trust people. I think, well, yeah, I may have gone a bit too hard, but I'm not going to, to murder you. I'm not going to throw you out. And just say you've made a mistake, say sorry, and that's it. Try and do better next time. But not one monk would confess. And I thought, so disappointing. You make a mistake, just let people know. And I felt so bad about that. And I walked out of the hall feeling really miserable. And it was only when I walked out of the hall, you know, in Bodhi Nyana Monastery, did it hit me. I remembered who left that hammer out in the grass. <laughs> it was me. <laughs> and I totally forgot about it. And I give it a talk, blasting my fellow monks. It's a wrong thing to do. You should look after things. You mustn't just leave things out just because they're given. You have to care for them. And it was me. <laughs> It was so embarrassing, but I went back inside and confessed. And everyone thought it was very funny, humiliating for me. <laughs> and that's my penance, I tell people. So I learned from that. Get your facts right, Ajahn Brahm, before you tell somebody off. Because <laughs> it comes back at you. <laughs> I remember another occasion. Oh, just, I don't know why these things always happen when your mother is with you. My poor old mother's dead now, but... Oh, just I was visiting her in London. And, you know, she goes out shopping and I was there to spend time with my mum. So she was going shopping on a Saturday morning, so I went with her. And she went to, if anyone knows London, Ealing Broadway. There's lots of shops there, lots of people. And I was walking with my mum. And then somebody shouted out, Hey, Harry Krishna. No, nah, you know, they know that you know, many years ago, you know, they don't know what a Buddhist monk is, and they just think they're all the same. So my mum was with me. I said, okay, look, mum, I'm not having this. I've got to educate this person. And this person, he was wearing a beanie and a sort of, you know, a coat because it was cold. And I went up to him and said, excuse me, sir, look, I am not Hare Krishna. I'm a Buddhist monk, okay? You should know better. And he listened quite patiently and smiled. And then he lifted off his beanie, had a little ponytail at the back. He said, I know you're a Buddhist monk. I'm Hare Krishna. Yeah. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. <laughs> <laughs> and there was again, I was so humiliated. <laughs> so hopefully that's happened to you because that teaches a lesson. Sometimes before you criticize somebody else, please make sure you got your facts right. And number two... <laughs> Sometimes the right time and the place. Because if somebody's going to receive criticism, you don't criticize them in public. You take them aside, you know, a quiet place. And also when they're not tired. If you've got something to say to your husband, say, you're going to criticize him for something or other. Don't do it when he comes home from work on a Friday. He's tired. He's had enough. And just one word from you, wife. That's it. So no, what to do? Dress up really nicely. Take him out for dinner. <laughs> it's obvious to me. I'm a monk. I know these things. Take him out for dinner. When you get to a favorite restaurant, when you get to the last course, he's all softened up. <laughs> and then you can tell him. He doesn't get angry then. You can criticize anybody on the last course after a good restaurant meal. <laughs> So I tell the monks that, look, if you've got to criticize anybody, we only eat once a day, so wait till after lunch. <laughs> and then you can say anything to us. We're so soft, we're like a, a wet sack of potatoes. You know, just, you know, you can do anything and we just don't fight back. <laughs> so, you choose the right time and place if you're going to make any criticism. Get your facts right. And then the most important thing, which was told by the Buddha, why are you doing that? What's the point of it? And that is the most important. You know, when this lady said about criticizing monks in Thailand, you know, why are you doing that for? Are you, if it really is, 
you have like the best interest of that person at heart. You really want sort of you know, to have a Buddhism you're proud of, or a Christianity you're proud of, or a government you're proud of. If that's why you're doing it, fine. You have a good motivation. But so much of the criticism which we give to one another is not good motivation. It's putting somebody down so you can be higher, or you feel higher. It's just conceit, ego, pride. That's why we sometimes criticize each other. Uh, sometimes it's just revenge. You criticize me, though I'm gonna now I'm gonna let you know. You know, you have the goal to criticize me now. Let me get at it you. See what you're doing. So if it comes from the right place, it's a wonderful thing to do. And a person actually feels that as well. You know, you have their best interests at heart, and they feel that. And you can tell them, oh, you know, you're doing something wrong, or you should do it a little bit better if it's at all possible. And that means you have a relationship there of kindness. And only when there's a relationship of kindness, all the defensiveness, all the fear vanishes, and the person can actually hear what you're trying to say. You realize they, you know, they have your best interests at heart. But if you don't come from the right place, you know, you know what it's like when you're criticized at work by your family members, you just don't receive it, because it's not coming from the right place. So it has to be coming from the right place. And if, it, if you fulfill all of those basic requirements, you know, you get your facts right, the right time and place is coming from kindness and you speak to the point gently, then that's right admonition. You can do that to anybody, even monks, nuns, politicians, whatever, and you'll find it is giving feedback. It's not giving ill will or anger, it's giving feedback. And that makes everybody better. You know, in the time of the Buddha, for this is for all those you know, listening in other countries, in the time of the Buddha, lay people would always be criticizing the monks, but also praising them as well. And that's actually where the monks, we got all our rules from. You know, you saw us doing something wrong. Like, in any organization, there's always some scallywags. And there was, <laughs> somebody just asked me earlier, because they gave me some chocolates, and I told people, how much chocolate does a monk need? And I won't say who it is, a woman, and within earshot of me, said, you can't have enough chocolate. <laughs> you can always have some more. And it's like, that woman really loves chocolate. But whatever, you know, say, you know, what can you give a monk who wants nothing? You know, just chocolate. So anyway, no, please don't give me any more chocolate. You know, I've just got too much chocolate. But anyway, what do you give a monk who wants, who's got nothing? And so that was a question which was asked of a monk in the time of the Buddha. And these were scallywag monks. He said, oh, just give something which I never get. Oh, what's that venerable? What can I get you which no one else gets you? And he said, booze. Really scanning work. Monks aren't supposed to have alcohol. But anyway, sort of, you know, lay people heard that and they thought, oh, this is a good idea. So they gave this monk alcohol, more alcohol, and more alcohol. And they got, he got so drunk that, you know, he passed out. And this is always what happens when you make a mistake. He passed out, and who would come right you know, in his direction? His boss, the Buddha. And the Buddha caught him, busted him. You know, what are you lying down there for? And he just he heard the Buddha, he moved around and pointed his feet at the Buddha. And the Buddha said, look, now, if he was, you know, had mindfulness, he would never do such a thing. And he said that's why he banned alcohol. And this is actually, you know, coming from criticism, not from the, the lay people first of all, that this is actually where we've got our rules from. It keeps us honest. And this is what you should do. But sometimes criticism is not enough. Sometimes we need a bit more wise um, strategies to actually improve things in life. Because there was, once there was this, this group of monks that had a big argument. Our monks argue as well sometimes. Not in our monastery. We always live together like milk and honey, don't we? Or, no, not like milk and honey, like condensed milk and tea. That's my motto. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have arguments sometimes, but you know, it's ne never sort of violent or anything like that. But these monks were really getting at it. And what the lay people did, they solved the problem. And it's very easy to solve the problem. If you have a group of monks or nuns creating problems, so easy. 
This is how to do it. Don't feed us. Because <laughs> you know that, you know, those of you who know the Buddhist tradition, we depend on alms food. We can't store food, we can't cook food. We have to rely on you. And if you don't come to feed us, we can't eat. That's what happened to me when I first came to Perth. You know, it was only a small group of people. We had a small house in North Perth, in Magnolia Street. And sometimes you guys wouldn't come. We'd wake up in the morning and there'd be food in the fridge. But we can't touch it. We can't do anything. It has to be offered. And we'd be waiting, 10.30. They haven't come yet. 11 o'clock, please. 11.30, we've got to eat before noon. 5 to 12, please, 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 please. And then they come about half past 12. Oh, sorry, we're late. <laughs> so I went hungry. That happened very often. But if you do it on purpose, then soon you will <laughs> we'll start behaving. And that's actually what they did at this monastery in Kosambi, which is where, I think it's Allahabad, isn't it? Where it's in these days. And in that place, there's a big monastery, they're having an argument, they couldn't settle it, so all the lay people decided, okay, we're not going to feed the monks. Seven days later, <laughs> the argument was settled. <laughs> the poor monks were so hungry and starving, okay, we're not going to argue anymore. <laughs> now that is in places like Thailand, Sri Lanka, Burma, here in Australia, if there's anyone misbehaves, don't support those monks. Don't feed them. Don't give them any donations, and then they soon, they learn. That's a, but don't do it out of ill will, do it out of kindness. Sometimes people do need sort of a harsh lesson sometimes. But that's okay to do such things. But of course, know the facts. What is a monk? What is a nun? And you don't need, you know, it's good to actually have some knowledge of the sutras and the Vinaya. These are the teachings of the Buddha. But you know, even in Australia, you don't really need to go into too much detail because people have a feeling of what a monk is or what a nun is. When I first came to Australia, that I was uh, teaching over in Bunbury Jail, and the only place I could really stay was with the Catholics over in the, the uh, parish house in Bunbury next to the cathedral. And so I remember one evening just asking them, is it okay for you guys, Catholics, you know, that we call ourselves monks? Because a monk is a Christian word. And they say, well, you know, what do you do? You know, we're celibate, and we have vows of poverty, we don't have any money, we live very simple lifestyles. I said, yeah, exactly, that's what a monk is. That's what a nun is. You know what, you know what a nun is? You know, none of this, none of that, that's what they're called. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> so monk, you have an idea what a monk is. And if you see a monk driving a Porsche, that's not a monk. If you see them with girlfriends, that's not a monk. Actually, that's one of the other things which almost happened to me once. Be careful not to criticize people just on appearances. Because it's just, you know, associations. When I did go down to Bunbury at this parish house, it was I stayed there overnight, taught in the evening of the prison, but, you know, in the afternoon I always had a free afternoon. And one day, it's a true story, one day I went down to the beach in Bunbury to, to meditate. No one was there at all. The beach was deserted. It was a you know, cool day. Not, I say it was quite warm. It was in the summertime. And I went there just to meditate, just to have a nice time. I was meditating there for two hours. And a nice meditation. I'm a good meditator. Just by myself, nice and quiet, really having a great meditation, two hours. And when I opened my eyes, there was two people on either side of me. And honestly, the, the one, there was a 17-year-old gorgeous blonde in a bikini. <laughs> she right here. And the other side was this gorgeous redhead, 17-year-old, in bikini too. If someone had a camera, I'd, my reputation would be shot. <laughs> There's that champagne on Bunbury Beach with his two girlfriends. What had happened... It was totally innocent. What had happened, the truth was, I'd been meditating there in the afternoon, and it was the last day of school. The old TEE examinations, the last one was that afternoon. Bunbury High School was just over the road. Finished school for the year, and all the kids got in their bathers, the girls in the bikinis, to celebrate. And two of the girls, they'd seen this strange 
person on the beach sitting perfectly still in a brown robe and they were fascinated. And they were both sitting either side of me waiting patiently for me to come out of meditation to ask what I was doing and you know, what meditation is. They were really impressed. And so, totally innocent, but you know, what would have looked like on the front pages of the West Australian, I would not want to, <laughs> to contemplate. <laughs> So get your facts right first of all, just appearances can sometimes be deceiving. So anyway, sort of, you know, get your facts right and always be kind. And it's okay, you don't make any bad karma, you know, by criticizing anybody, no matter how high they are. Because we don't like this idea of monks or nuns being treated like royalty, like, you know, holy such holy people that you know you must not say anything bad about a holy person. Please do not treat any monk like a holy person. Just treat them just like as a person. And if they really are the real holy people, the really ones who are really holy are the ones you don't know. They're the secret ones. The ones sitting next to me, who knows? You know Ajahn Bamali but do you know this one? Who knows? <laughs> Because we don't sort of uh, flout, uh, flaunt it or any attainments of anything. So, when you are sort of criticizing anybody, as long as you're coming from the right place, it is okay. It's not a sin, it's good karma, in fact, giving people feedback. But, whenever we do give criticism, where are you coming from and why are you doing that? And a lot of times, you know, always see that psychology that you always tend to criticize other people for what you do yourselves, because you see those things in other people. If you criticize someone else for being angry, it's usually because you're angry. If you accuse someone else of being sloppy, it's because you're usually sloppy. If you accuse someone else of being a control freak, <laughs> it's because you're a control freak as well. Have you ever noticed that? So why are you doing this? First of all, make sure that you know, those things you're criticizing in another person, you haven't got in yourself if you possibly can. And also you find out that a lot of times that when you are tired, sick, weak, you tend to be incredibly critical. One of the reasons, this is going to be controversial, one of the reasons why people criticize monks in Thailand is because they're not happy. Even the people who criticize are tired and too stressed out. It's the sickness of the whole society. And the reason is because you do find that when you're rested, when you're relaxed, you tend not to be so critical. Two monks sitting either side of me, just know this. They've lived with me for such a long time they think, I am a very soft monk, I'm not a control freak, but I don't tell people off. Why? Is it because I'm soft or scared of telling people off? There's another reason, which is far more profound. Because I rest, I can meditate, I can get some nice energy coming up inside of me, you tend to lose what we call the fault-finding mind. The more tired you are, the more you can see what's wrong with things. And when you relax and you start energizing your mind, what were faults before become beauty. You don't find fault, you find beauty instead. Because the fault and beauty is not inherent in the object. The reason I'm saying this is because this one guy, one of Ajahn Bamali's friends, he's also a physicist who spent time in Cambridge and he's coming to our monastery. If you're there listening, Grillo, I'm talking about you, that he sent me an email today saying I answered a philosophy question for him, sort of the nature of beauty. Is beauty in the object or is it somewhere else? Why do you think something is beautiful? Some years ago I went on pilgrimage to India and they took me to also to the Taj Mahal. You know, because it was basically on the way from where we were going visiting the Buddhist holy sites and to, to Delhi where we get the flight back to Perth. And instead of actually just touring around, I sat down at a distance 
and I asked myself the question, why is this beautiful? Now the Taj Mahal is one of the icons, the places you must go and see. People say it's one of the most beautiful architectural achievements. Why? And so I spent half an hour just contemplating, why is that beautiful? Is it beautiful in the architecture, the shape? Or is it because people have told me it's beautiful? Why is it beautiful? Is beauty in the object? Is the fault in the object? Or is it in the observer? And the answer came, according to Mr. Grillo, from a talk I gave, where I mentioned one of my grossest stories. I don't know if did I t and I told this on retreats, all the time on retreats, but I don't think I told it on a Friday night about the toilet bowl, did I? Recently? If you've been on retreat, you know this one. Okay, so it's meditation. Because when you meditate, really meditate, you get so peaceful, so still, you get energy coming up. That's what I was talking earlier about, the delight in the body. Just when you relax, it feels really good. And you meditate, you get so still. Your, your mind gets energized. You feel really happy. And it's occurred so many times. I have a couple of anecdotes. A girl came to my Tuesday night class in Armadale, a woman, and she told me afterwards, said, oh, I never felt like coming this evening. It was a Tuesday evening, I had a hard day at work, I had to make dinner for the family. And, uh, no, I think I'll miss it tonight, no meditation. And my child sent me, my six-year-old, Mummy, are you going to meditation tonight? No, I don't feel like it. Mummy, you must go to meditation tonight. No, not tonight, I'm too tired. Mummy, go to meditation. Why, darling? Because you're a much nicer mummy when you come home for meditation. <laughs> Six-year-old. Or like this other girl, she sent me an email when she came on one of my retreats, exec from Sydney, had to beg, you know, grovel to her boss to get a week off, you know, to go on a meditation retreat. When she went back to work in Sydney on a Monday morning, after the retreat, hardly any rest, because, you know, leave on Sunday afternoon. And the boss looked at her and said, what drug have they been giving you in Perth? Whatever it is, please bring me back some next time. <laughs> she was happier. You could see that. When you're happier, you're positive. You don't find so much fault. Now that's ordinary meditators, when you really get into it. This is my gross story. So, you know, any kids here, please. It's not that gross, but more Ajahn Brahm toilet humor. <laughs> really gross. So I just finished a beautiful meditation, really deep meditation, over in Jhana Grove. And I had to get up to go to the toilet. You know, monks are human, have to go to the toilet. And as I say, to do a, a number two. You'll know what a number two is. Okay, so ordinary up to the point where I made a big mistake. My mistake was to look in the toilet bowl. Wow. In all my life, I'd never seen such a beautiful piece of shit. <laughs> now honestly, now it looks so incredibly beautiful. Now have you ever really contemplated just the browns? It wasn't just one shade of brown, it was this, this whole, whole range like, like, <laughs> what is it called? Like a rainbow of different colors of browns. And just the way they were all interacting together, it was like it was painted by a Raphael. And when it comes to the way these little balls were all put together, it was like a Michelangelo sculpture. And I always notice, you may notice this, there's always a little bit of mucus somewhere, which is on the outside. <laughs> it, just, it just makes the whole thing like sparkle with the water in the light. It's like a diamond, it's like a jewel. And now, now, we haven't even, even mentioned yet the aroma, the scent, which is, which is really full. You know, just some of these other scents, or these, especially the fragrances of flowers, they're so weak. This is full. And, and just, it totally just absorbs you. And, honestly, I was just so amazed at this, what was floating in the toilet bowl. And 
Honestly, I won't tell a lie. I really thought to take it out and show it to some friends. <laughs> Honestly, I thought that because it was so beautiful and wonderful. I've never seen anything so, so gorgeous in my whole life. And it was only, only because for years I trained in letting go. Because, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I'm not attached to things. You guys, you know, you take it out and put it in your bag and bring it home with you. But for me, because of my training, I was able. It was a tough thing to do, but I succeeded. It was one of the most greatest achievements to press the button and watch the most beautiful piece of shit in the world go down the toilet and out of my life forever. I still grieve. <laughs> But you may laugh, you may think it's gross, it's not a joke, that was actually true. It looked so incredibly beautiful. And was the beauty in a piece of excrement or was it in my mind? And this is just an extreme case. <laughs> very extreme you might say, but true. Is that when you have a very strong mind, you can see beauty in anything. And you can't see faults in things. You just can't see them. And what for other people is a fault, as I keep on saying, just the damage on the barks of trees, is beautiful. You see the rain, it's gorgeous. You go to prisons and see paedophiles and rapists and murderers, and they're wonderful people. You see you guys, and I love you all, can't see faults in you. See my monks, they're great monks. Incredible, wonderful nuns, you can't see faults in them. Simply because the fault is not in a person, it's in the one who's looking. Same as beauty. The beautiful, you don't need, you spend all your money going to these spas and beauty parlours, but beauty literally is in the eye of the beholder. And this is how you put it there. You learn how to rest, relax, be still, and you get energy coming up. Now one of the other stories, is not so gross, it was just ordinary story, how you can put more beauty into your life. Go slower. Because this was a story when, I tell this again meditation retreats very rarely on a Friday night, when I was uh, maybe seven, eight years, living at Serpentine, and went out somewhere in the morning, forget what I was doing there, giving a talk here, or a funeral, or something or other. And anyway, came back, and it was a beautiful um, spring day. And I told the driver, let me out at the bottom of the hill, I want to walk up. And he said, no, you can't do that. You're a monk, you're a bum. i got to drive you. He said, let me out. I have to argue for people to get exercise. <laughs> <laughs> they let me out, and I walked up the hill. For those of you who've been up to our monastery, Bodhinyana, it's about 2.16 kilometers from the, the highway up to the top of the hill. It's quite a steep hill if you walk it. The other day we saw poor cyclists trying to get up the hill. One of them <laughs> had given up, and he was walking, just dragging his bicycle behind him. It's a really steep hill. But anyway, I was walking up it. I just had all the time in the world. You're not conquering Everest, you're just having a wonderful morning, so just take your time. And I was walking, looking around me, and that hillside, I couldn't recognize it. It looked totally different than anything I'd ever seen before. And I'd been living up there for seven years. And I thought, what's going on? How come I can't recognize this hillside where I travel up and down two or three times a week? And so I stopped. Stunned. When I stopped, the hillside changed again. Now I could see things I'd never ever noticed before. Beautiful things. You can actually see there's a, a stream in the valley down below. You can see the little rocks and the way the water flows over the rocks and the moss on the rocks. And you look at the trees. You know, the bark is incredibly refined and, and complicated and beautiful. And the, even the grass, it actually glowed. More green than I've ever seen before. 
And I thought, you know, what are they giving me for lunch? Have they put some drugs in the lunch or what's going on? Because I'd never seen the hillside so beautiful before. And then I started contemplating. And just the explanation was very simple but very profound at the same time. Before, for seven years, I've been looking at that hillside through the window of a speeding car. What happens when you look through a car window going at speed? The light which hits the back of your eye, the retina, doesn't have time to form a proper image. Even It's a chemical reaction. So the colours aren't fully formed and another image comes up and then another image, then another image. The images go so fast that none is fully formed. Get out of the car, walk. The images have more time, the chemical reaction has more time to finish. You see more and the colours are richer. The greens, the browns, the blues of the skies are deeper. But when you go to the next stage, you're not walking but you're stopping, standing still and staring. Then the full image comes up on the back of your eye. All the colours are fully developed. And all the detail now emerges and your mind has got enough time to explore it. My goodness, that's gorgeous. Never is the grass so green as when you stand still and let the colours come to you. You never see so much detail as when you're still and it's gorgeous. It's exactly the same phenomena with a piece of shit in the toilet bowl. The beauty was always there, but I couldn't see it, because I was going too fast. I was living life like looking through the window of a speeding car, and I could not see the beauty, which was always there, if I could only slow down. This is one of the problems with modern life. We go so fast. Even when we don't need to, we can't just stop still and just stare at the ocean. Not doing anything, not going anywhere, just being and letting the beauty of the ocean just come to us. We can't just look at the human being and just be with them instead of doing something, changing them. We are so busy, always working, doing stuff, running around. Our life is like lived in a car, our body speeding around. When you come to places like this, we teach you how to slow down. Whether you like it or not, you get slower. Little by little, you get even slower. And maybe you might even start to stop totally in meditation. And when you open your eyes, it's beautiful, it's gorgeous. Always was, but you couldn't see it simply because your mind did not have the energy to see beauty, to energize. Those of you get up in the morning before your first cup of coffee, you're a horrible person, you're like a monster. You're not worth talking to until you've had your first cup of coffee. Why is that? Because that first cup of coffee gives you a bit of a boost of energy. Okay, it's fake energy, it's borrowed energy, but it's energy and it makes life look much nicer after a good cup of coffee. Now imagine taking that further, the natural energy of stillness. You start to see beautiful things and you don't become so negative. Some people say, but you have to be negative. If we don't find fault, things will get worse. Really? We've been finding fault all our life. Have you ever solved the problems? by finding fault with things. How about doing the opposite, finding beauty in things? What you see in another person is what they show you back. And what they show you back, they start to see in themselves. If you start to see beauty in another person, they see it in themselves. They say, wow, I'm a beautiful person. There's nothing wrong with me. I'm 72. And I'm gorgeous, I'm hot. <laughs> Why not? 
if beauty is in the eye of the beholder, why not? Trouble is, all those people looking at you is their problem, not yours. <laughs> They're going too damn fast, <laughs> they can't see it. Now imagine, this is one of the reasons why this thing we're doing over here is really, really profound. Learning how to meditate, to slow down, even to stop, you are going to be a happier person. You're not going to be so depressed. Depressed person, they find faults in everything. There's nothing worthwhile. Ajahn Brahm's jokes are terrible. Buddha society, West Australia, we should have more chairs, we should have better air conditioning, better tea, better this, this, terrible. West Australia, terrible. Government, terrible. Come on. It's not that bad. Is it? You say, yes it is, I know what you're thinking. No, it's not that bad. And you, you look at yourself in the mirror, oh God, I'm really old and ugly now. No, you are not. If you can get some deep meditation, and you're still, you look in the mirror, wow, this beautiful person I'm looking at, I really mean a beautiful person. Simply because, if you can see beauty in a piece of shit, it's easy to see beauty <laughs> in yourself. <laughs> Honestly, you can, it's so easy. That is why someone like me is not so critical. If I can love a piece of shit, monks are easy to love. <laughs> and you guys, it's easy. I mean, pedophiles, easy. And if you can see something good in them, instead of finding fault, what happens? They see it in themselves and they change. You see it in yourself and it changes. Uh, I'm going over this story again, but this is, oh, I love this story. Singapore Institute of Mental Health, a few years ago, giving a keynote address there. And I have a great life as a monk, give keynote addresses everywhere. I was at Wacos yesterday, giving a keynote address somewhere. I always like giving keynote addresses. I've got the 2015 World Computer Conference in Seoul. Guess who's giving the keynote address? <laughs> know nothing about computers, but that doesn't stop me. <laughs> They have great fun doing this sort of stuff. Anyway, the Institute of Mental Health, actually I know a little bit about that, so that's much easier. And afterwards this guy came along and said, can you bless my ward? And said, what ward are you running? He said, schizophrenia. And I think everyone here has had contact with schizophrenia, people who have that terrible disease, and just how, how nasty it is. How it takes, you know, maybe your brother or your son and gives them such a terrible life, maybe. Depends. Because I asked this guy, I said, well, how do you treat schizophrenia in Singapore? And he smiled, his beautiful smile, and said, just like you teach Ajahn Brahm, I do not treat schizophrenia in Singapore. But you're the professor of the schizophrenia ward. What do you mean you don't treat schizophrenia? I treat the other part of the patient, which is not schizophrenic. And I thought, that really inspired me. That, wow, brilliant, well done. And you know, Sri Lanka, you worship monks, I worship that guy. His wisdom. Well done. How are the results? So much better than conventional treatment. He saw on the other part of the person, not the faults, but the part in that person which was perfect, which was beautiful. He saw the beauty, not the faults. That's why the beautiful part grew. All of you having troubles in your relationships. Why? You see the faults in your partner. It's natural because you're tired. You haven't got enough energy. You don't do enough meditation. You don't see your partner like a beautiful piece of... <laughs> no, I'm not going there. <laughs> it's in your eyes. Their faults are in the eyes of you. Just like beauty is in the eye of beholder, faults are in the eye of beholder as well. Haven't you ever felt that? There's nothing wrong with me, husband. Why don't you like me? 
wife. Why didn't you like me? It's in the eyes of the beholder. So imagine, you come here, do meditation, peaceful, still, you don't rush around so much. And you see this person you're sharing your life with, it's a beautiful person. You don't see the faults. Instead you see the beautiful part of them. And that beautiful part of them, what you see in them, grows. You see it, they see it, it grows. Which means you have this wonderful relationship. Have you ever been with somebody who really loves you, appreciates you, can't see your faults? Maybe that was your mother or your grandma. She could do it. Why can't your partner? They can, if they come to places like this. <laughs> Can you see what we're making here? Incredible, powerful, beautiful world. And take off all the fault finding, the negativity, which causes so many problems, just in a family, let alone in a country or in a world. It's a beautiful world we're living in. Can't you see it? If you can't, it's because you're going too fast. Whatever you see, the colors are all drained. That's what happens looking through the window of a car. Try this out tomorrow on the weekend, the street in which you live. How many times you always go up and down that street in the car? Walk. And every now and again, a few meters stop, stare. It's amazing what you'll see. Things, the street in which you've lived 30, 40 years, you'll see new stuff. Always been there, been going too fast. Go on a walk in the forest, stop. There's incredible beauty there. Why can't we see it? See it in nature first. See it in your partner. And then go to the final stage. See it in yourself. Incredible beauty inside of you. I can see it. Why can't you? Why are people so down on themselves? <laughs> remember one of the, <laughs> oh, I always remember this case. This young girl, she was about 15. She was having some sort of psychology problems. Psychologists, therapists couldn't fix her up. So the father asked, Ajahn Brahm, can you try and sort it out? <coughs> yeah, sure. And so this young girl came in, 15, really pretty young girl. And I said, what, what's the problem? And, you know, it took a while to get it out of her. So what's, what's the problem? Why are you not upset? Why don't you like yourself? And she said, isn't it obvious? I said, well, no, what, what is it? She said, it's, it's my nose, it's too big. <laughs> and I was a scientist before. So, you know, I couldn't actually get the, the tape measure out, but, you know, mentally I measured her nose. And I said, actually, it's you know, a pretty normal nose. It's not too big, it's not too small. It's you know, in the middle range of noses. <laughs> that didn't work for her because I didn't realize it's not what her nose was. It's how she perceived it. The ugliness was in her eyes. And I failed, I couldn't do anything with her. But I learned a lot from that. Are you, have you got a big nose? Measure it. <laughs> it's an average nose. So what? <laughs> but to see it as beautiful, we get rid of the fault-finding mind. We have this beautiful, this wonderful idea of like, not fault finding, appreciation, stillness. And we see, actually, it is a beautiful nurse. And that is a huge catharsis for a human being. They realize, there's nothing wrong with you. And when you do that, wow, there's nothing wrong with me. No, you're beautiful. Really? It takes a while. I can't tell you that. I can't make you believe that. But after a while, when you stop and become more still, stop running around so much, you see it in yourself. Just like your mother or grandmother once saw you, you can see that in yourself. Now that is happiness. Finding fault or finding beauty. What type of world do you want to live in? Now you know how to live in the beautiful world. Thank you for listening.
<laughs> Very good. Excellent. Okay, here we go. So from Spain, Indonesia, and from Texas. It's really good. Every evening we get from all over the world. Dear Ajahn, doctors find faults to treat diseases. Plum and plumbers find faults to fix leaks. We all find faults to know what to improve and bring peace. You found fault with London and left a better in Thailand and work on your faults under a great teacher. So isn't fault fight tending natural as long as we do it with kindness? Yeah, I left all these places. I'll be leaving Perth if I find fault with Perth. And I notice many monks, they disrobe because they find fault with being a monk. And then they find fault you know, with you know, being with another person. They find fault with themselves. Fault finding is natural in the sense that many people do it, but is it good? Is it wise? And are we really improving things? Because sometimes you find faults to fix leaks, then you find fault with the... Once the leaks are fixed in the kitchen, you find fault with the kitchen, you want a better kitchen. How many of you are arguing with your husband, you want a new kitchen? Isn't the old one good enough? No, of course not, you find faults with it. And listen, wives, if you want a new kitchen, the husband will find fault with you and get a new wife. <laughs> Be careful. <laughs> so sometimes, find faults with things, it's just endless. So, no, I don't agree with that. It's common, but it's not necessary. And I think we find fault too much. And because we find fault too much, we have this restless culture called modern times. Always trying to improve. Knock down old buildings, make Elizabeth Key new buildings all over the place. Can't we find another way? Appreciate what we have instead of finding fault with it. And a lot of times, the biggest problem with human beings, they find fault with themselves. They find fault with partners so they can't live together. And I just can't understand that. As a monk, You've got a beautiful partner. Yeah, they're not the best, don't find fault with them. They're good enough. And always be very appreciative. Remember, if they were perfect, your partner was perfect, they would have married someone much better than you. <laughs> so just be grateful. You're not perfect either. So just look at yourselves with beauty and just have fun together. Okay, anyway. Dear Ajahn, my, here we go, from Indonesia. My partner often comments on my wrongdoings. I appreciate it, but right now it seems that I have changed myself and I've become somebody he wants. I feel not in control of myself and just do what is suitable for my partner. Finding faults in myself is good, but why do I feel like I gave lost my own self? Exactly. You know, because sometimes you try and please other people, and that is endless. How much of your life has been spent pleasing somebody else? And then you say, well, okay, not doing that, I'm going to now please myself. And that's just as bad. So don't please anybody, you don't have to, you're good enough. So you're beautiful enough. When you stop finding fault, both of those disappear. Dear Ajahn, you always say you are good enough. We are not supposed to change things, don't hope for things to be different. How about if one's family member has an addiction? Why have they got an addiction? You know, you all know that addictions are running away from what? Running away from yourself because you don't think you are good enough. And it's, that's one of the reasons why people do get addicted to uh, all sorts of drugs and gambling, pornography. What, what are you doing that for? It's because we don't think we're good enough. We don't deserve better. We don't deserve to be healthy. We don't deserve to have a uh, someone love us. And a lot of those, the deeper reasons why we do have addictions, again, is because of fault-finding negativity. This is a, it's a rotten life which we live in these days. Now you go to school, and you're never good enough at school. Even if you come top of the class, they move you into a bigger school, where you're in the middle of the class again. And it means you're never good enough, you can always do better. You come second, you have to get first. You get first, you have to get first again. You know, you look at these poor footballers 
You know, I've been watching the, not watching it, but reading about it. Fremantle Dockers and Eagles, they're winning. And this, tonight, I don't know how many times the Fremantle Dockers have won every game so far. Apparently they're playing tonight. Now they've got to win again. Can't you ever be satisfied, you fans? We've won so many times. Can't we lose every now and again to make it fair? Why do we always have to win? So that's a trouble because there's no end to it. And this is one of the problems. Good enough, if you always have to succeed, you're never good enough. And what's it like growing up, finding a partner? You know, girls, you're never good enough. Because you compare yourself to what you see in the, in the, in the uh, glossy magazines. You know, you're never like that. And sometimes guys, you know, they criticize, you know, you've got flat chested, you know, you've got mousy hair, you know, you've got big nose or whatever. It's, it's terrible being a girl, trying to live up to what you're not. Guys, it's just as bad. You know, you always have the peer pressure to try and be tough, strong, whatever it is you're supposed to be. You know, as a guy, I can never figure out, what am I supposed to be? Whatever it was, it was never good enough. Can't tell me people what I'm supposed to be. Then at least I'll have some idea what I'm supposed to do and try and become. But whatever it was, it was never good enough. And you live like that and you go to work and you're never good enough. The boss tells you you're not good enough. Then you become a monk and if it's not with me, you say you're not good enough. You meditate more. You know, you should you know, do more or whatever. But I don't say that, do I? <laughs> So these, and these people here, I hope they, you know, they feel good enough. Because <laughs> otherwise, life is terrible. There's no end to it. So there comes a time when you say, oh, enough. I'm not going to try and please anybody else. I'm not going to live up to some artificial standard imposed upon me by our culture, by our society, whatever. I'm going to be good enough. You're gay, you're transgender, whatever you are, you're old. You Can't you just say you're good enough? and accept yourself for who you are and be at peace with yourself. Otherwise, there's no end. And there's no happiness, there's no peace. So that's one of the reasons why addictions start in the first place. So if someone has an addiction there, psychology, love that person. They have an addiction, but there's more to them than no addiction. Just like there's more to a person with schizophrenia than the schizophrenia. Treat the other part of your family member which isn't addicted. And that part will grow. Because they'll recognize there is something beautiful in them. Something worth saving. Something worth cultivating. And that will be the solution out of the addiction. Okay, there we go. That's the talk for this evening, so thank you. Any questions from the floor? Okay, so now let's pay respects to Buddha Dhamma Sangha and then uh, you can each go your own beautiful ways, but don't go too fast. Is that good enough? <laughs> 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 Bodhan Bhagavanta Abhiwa Demi Suvakato Bhagavata Dhammo Dhammang Namasami Supatipano Bhagavato Savaka Sango Sanghang Namami Very good. Oh, and uh, don't forget to buy your tickets for the Global Conference or Buddhism, otherwise I'll find fault with you. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>